following is a conversation with Professor Julian Marchese, Professor of Digestive Diseases at Imperial College London. Over his 22-year career, Professor Marchese has authored over 190 peer-reviewed publications. He currently sits as Chair of the British Society of Gastroenterology's Gut Microbiota for Health Expert Panel and also chaired the Microbiology Society's Unlocking the Microbiome Publication and Working Group. This is Inside Matters. My name is Dr. James McElroy. I hope you enjoy it. So not Inside Matters, Julian, but I'll tell you something, right? So um, people find it very hard to stay in silence. And I, I read this uh, article that's talking about an experiment where... Um, they gave young men a choice and the choice was you can either sit in silence for like 20 minutes or you can electrocute yourself uh, for 20 minutes and guess what they picked electrocution yeah <laughs> I, I, I could do the silence I could yeah do man the, of course I'm, I'm yeah I could do the silence you ever heard of these silent retreats I've always wondered if you'd be well I have yeah. and I always wonder if of those isolation pods yeah, the isolation where you, chambers. Where you just actually cut out all yeah. all stimulation. Yeah, I don't know how long. I mean, some people say you can last ten minutes. Some people just hate it. They freak out. Right, right. And the other one is um, anechoic chambers, which are totally silent. Wow. And a lot of people say that they can't cope with that because they just start hallucinating oral hallucinations. When really? all noises cut out, you can start hearing your heart. Yeah, right. It's a bit okay. freaky. And then yeah. you start hearing other noises. And some right. people say, no, get me out. You know, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, people wow. start going really freaked out. Wow. Well, the silent retreat is something I am going to do. Um, I went to a Buddhist monastery last weekend called Sami Ling. It's one, it's one of the largest in Europe. It's in Dumfries, south oh, of Scotland. Okay. I wouldn't have put one there. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, so I went just to check it out because I'm, I'm all about just trying new things, anything yeah. that could be related to wellness, health, yeah, fitness, yeah. whatever I'm kind of keen, yeah, mindfulness, yeah. yeah. So they do a day, two days, seven days, 10 days, I think. Maybe not specifically there, but some people do a 10 day silent retreat. And whilst on the face of it, that might sound quite like exotic and fun. That's quite a long time to not it speak is. to someone. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like they, you're sort of like, oh, what do I do? And no devices. Oh, no devices, no. No Wi-Fi? No Wi-Fi, nothing. Just silence. Just, just you well, and your Well, not thoughts. silence. I mean, you've got the environment around you. And they do meditations. Yeah. Maybe there's a bit of yoga. Um, but the, the yoga, the breathing, the cold water and the sauna, I think really changed my life in a positive way. Cold water, okay. Uh, ice cold water. There's a place beside, uh, and I don't know what the effect is in the microbiome. It seems as though I read an article every day and it's like this. Benefits your bacteria. I know. Exercise yeah. benefits your bacteria. I shared it because it's BBC and I, yeah. I like hyping things up, but I'm like, yeah. Everything can help you. But look, we're here to discuss. We are, yeah. Microbiomes. Yeah. And um, <laughs> they've had a bad press. I think they've had a bad press. And they've had a bad press because a lot of people have been pushing them. And it's an easy push. It's not like trying to push graphene or artificial intelligence because a lot of people don't get it. They, you know, right. you ask somebody, what, what's graphene? I have right. no idea what graphene is. You know, 99.9% right. .9 of people... What, what's artificial intelligence? Something that's artificial and intelligent. One of my biggest beefs with AI is I keep asking people what it is and they all tell me something different. Yeah. Half the time it's just machine so, learning. So it's just machine... And it's not... You know, and it, I, I, I did argue... I, don't, I wouldn't say argued. I think I, I did try to email one of the leading lights in this. I can't remember his name now, but he wrote a book called Life 3.0, which if you're into artificial intelligence, is a great read. Right, okay? right. Um, saying, should we call it synthetic intelligence? Okay, SI. And call artificial intelligence augmented intelligence. Interesting. Because all the things that they seem to be doing are augmenting what we do. So just right. like a JCB's augmented muscle... Okay, you wouldn't call call it an artificial human. Right. It's augmenting. It's augmenting what we can do. I can pick up a small stone. A JCB can pick up a very large stone and move lots more earth than me. And lots of the methods that you see in artificial intelligence are pattern recognition, which humans do very well. You know, it's one of our evolutionary traits that we can see patterns and that helps us discern maybe whether there's a predator in, in a hedge so we can see the pattern in there and we can get out of it. But then what it also leads to means we see patterns where there aren't patterns. You know, you look at a cloud, you can see a leopard in the clouds, but there's obviously no leopards up there. It's just a shape. Right. And a lot of um, artificial intelligence 
things or, or models that you see, a lot of them are just pattern recognition, but done much better because you can put in a lot more data into a computer and it can sieve through all that data much better than human mind can find and find a pattern, whether it's meaningful or not is another thing. So I, I try to push for this. Let's keep AI as augmented intelligence and real intelligence, which is something we've made, which is synthetic. We synthesized. Let's call it SI. Totally blank me, never emailed me back. Emailed me back. So Lost anything. I went with that. If it ever comes up in the future, you heard it here. Here first. we go. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but getting, Prof Marchese on yeah, Inside Matters. Yeah. But getting back to... Um, back to the microbiome. And we should, I'll make a note. We should definitely talk about... Um, AI and machine learning in the context of the microbiome. Oh, and, it, it's, and yeah, it, it's everywhere. I'll, no, any, I'll make a note. Yeah. Anything that's got lots of variables, that's too complex. You know, if it's got more than two variables or three variables, the human mind sort of implodes, doesn't it? You know, you've seen somebody walking down the street in a three-dimensional world trying to text and they're walking to a lamppost. That's, that's somebody <laughs> posing with three variables. Which is three dimensional, but maybe more than that. Or just like me this morning, I yeah, just, walked you know, right past Costa Coffee and simple totally thing, missed yeah. it. Because <laughs> your mind's somewhere else. But so anything that's multivariate or lots of variables, it could, could be machine a benefit. learning helps. So let's let's bring us back to the microbiomes yeah. and the bad press. And yeah, so I, I'm keen to to learn about your journey through the microbiome, yeah. like how it started and how it's changed and where we're at now. Yeah, but so. I, I got into this area 21 years ago. So I trained up as a biochemist, and then I got into microbiology, and then I got into environmental microbiology. And, and the buzz then was, we're going to understand the environment, and we understand that the microbes in the environment are a key player. They're foundational to those environments. You know, lots of, lots of different biogeochemical pathways, carbon, iron, phosphorus, sulfur, nitrogen. All those cycles which are fundamental to life on Earth have microbes somewhere in that cycle. And if you mess about with those microbes in that cycle, you will affect the cycle. You could close it down if it's a nitrogen cycle. And we won't know about the impact of that until maybe 20, 30 years into the future where we realise that sort of ammonia is not being made from nitrogen, plants are dying, and we've done something bad. And so there was a big push to understand the microbes and their roles and the ecosystem functions that they maintained. But the big problem was we were really bad at growing bacteria from the environment. It was this like dirty little secret that microbiologists had. If you took soil, we kept looking at it thinking, well... We know there are lots of microbes in there, but we can only grow 1% of them. So 99% of the microbes in that system wow. are just black, dark matter to us. We don't know. They're there. They're important, but we can't pull them out. We can't investigate them in isolation. We can't get at their genomes. We can't understand their biochemistry. We can measure big biochemical changes, you know, sort of changes in chemicals moving through soil. So you can put some you know, glucose into soil, sugar. And you can see carbon dioxide being made, you can see other molecules being made, but who's making it? How are they making it? Who, you know, is it several organisms feeding off different chemicals, cooperating with each other? No idea. And that's a big problem if you're trying to describe an ecosystem right. and you can't describe the main players in that ecosystem. So what a lot of, and it wasn't, well, I, I, you know, I, I helped add to this, but I didn't, wouldn't say I pioneered this, but a lot of clever microbiologists re realized that you could use DNA-based approaches. And this was going back to people like Linus Pauling, who got a Nobel Prize, for understanding that DNA could be used from, a, from an organism to understand its evolution. You know, it's a fundamental aspect of understanding that. We, we take it for granted. We can use DNA to understand evolution of organisms. But back in the 60s, that was a big leap to realise that DNA doesn't just only contain the information to make an organism, it contains information on the natural history of that organism, right. where it's come from, what it's related to, who its neighbour is um, in the tree of life. And this was big because at the time we couldn't build a tree of life of bacteria. And that's because it was too hard to culture them? Not just that, it's because they all look the same. If you look at the tree of life of big animals, you can see, well, there's a four-legged animal over there. I'll put in a group of other four-legged animals. There's animals here who walk on two legs. I'll put those in a group, okay? That's a reptile. I'll put in a group of reptiles. That gives live, um, birth to a living organism. That's a mammal. I'll put him in a mammal. So for big animals, morphology and features they have and things they do are easy to start clumping them together and say... They must be related to each other. You know, apes are related to us. Mm. Cows are related to horses somewhere because they're four-legged. Um, ruminants are related to other ruminants, you know, um, and so forth. But if you look at microbes, they're just spheres, right. sausages, curved sausages, chains of spheres, and that's it. 
And yet you'll find some microbes that are so different to another microbe, but morphologically they're shaped, they're identical, they're just spheres. Right. But one could live at the bottom of the ocean, 500 metres below the sea floor, take sulphur as its energy source and turn it into other sulphur forms and cope with high pressure and it looks like a spiral piece of pasta. You can find another one which lives in fresh water, doesn't need oxygen, well the other one doesn't need oxygen, so totally different metabolically, totally different genetically, and yet you look under the microscope and I say, well I can't tell the two apart. So this was a real problem for us. We never had a tree of life for bacteria that allowed us to say, if I pull a new bacterium out, I can put it into my tree of life and show actually where it is related to every other organism in that tree of life. And people like Linus Pauling and then um, others came along. Um, um, Carl Woese was the other one. Came right. along and realised that, well, you can use DNA, you can compare DNA from organisms, and if that DNA is identical, chances are that those organisms are identical. And as that mm. DNA becomes less and less identical, it means that those organisms are less and less identical, and they've also um, evolved different pathways. Right. And right now, we, we know today that the genomic potential of the microbiome is orders of magnitude greater than that of its host, yeah, right? Yeah. Did we know that then? Or was it hypothesized? No, no, it wasn't known then. It, it wasn't even hypothesized. But what we did know was that bacteria, the way they adapt, they don't change their shape, they change their genomes, and they share DNA. And right. so what we knew was genetically, bacteria were much more diverse anyway than mammals. Mammals are pretty boring genetically. You know, that's what we can do experiments on mice. Because there's genetically they have a lot of the pathways we have so that you know we haven't evolved that far from a mouse or we haven't evolved that far from a horse and so if you look at g genes in mammals we all more or less all share the same genes in mammals there are nuances here and there and so we knew from a, from early on that bacteria were really good at adapting to environments by changing their dna because they grow quickly they evolve quickly swapping their dna and that's why we have this um, antibiotic resistance um, pandemic hurtling down towards us because they share these genes that, that allow them to be antibiotic resistant. And so what we did in the environmental setting was we said, right, we can't grow them, but we can extract all the DNA from a system. And with sequences, right. the early sequences were slow, so we did things on a smaller scale compared to today. How slow? Like, what was the process? If you were, if you were sequencing 96 pieces of DNA, that was considered a big project. Wow. And okay. so what we have to do is you, you take your DNA, you break it up, you put it into another piece of DNA, which you could then put into the workhorse of the laboratory, which was Escherichia coli. And then you would pick off your Escherichia coli, repurify the DNA and send it off for sequencing. So picking off 96 colonies and purifying them, send it off. And, and it wasn't cheap. You know, it, it wasn't cheap compared to, to sequencing today. The price of sequencing per base, per ACG and T, has dropped phenomenally. It's gone through the floor. You know, we're down to 0 0.0001 pence. And that's because base. of the engineering and the technology? That's because of the Archon X Prize, which pushed people to... So the, the Archon X Prize, so there, there were two of them. There, one of them was to get people into space cheaply. And okay. the, I think it might have been the second one was to get either a $10 or $100 human genome. And the idea was... Wow. Precision medicine. Big goals. Big goals. So, and actually, <laughs> really was, big I think goals. it was only a million dollar or $10 million prize. So that was just, it was a nice prize, but the cost of actually making these machines would have outweighed the prize. It was a kudos of being the first company who could say, we can actually sequence a human genome Got it. for $10. So Got it. You, the idea was democratise it and put in a GP primary health care. You know, somebody will come in, the idea was, bit of blood, pff, there's your genome, and the whole personalised precision genomic medicine would kick in. Okay, so, it never so, happened. So, so people have been talking about that grand vision of, hey, come to your GP, give a bit of this, get it all profiled, they'll yeah. tell you everything. Yeah. That People have had that vision for quite a while, right? Well, and Since, wasn't it 2000 when the human <laughs> genome was done? We, you know, it was going to revolutionise. <laughs> and then what we found was, well, we haven't got that many genes, and we've got yeah. a lot of DNA that's in there doing nothing, yeah. we thought. And the... Uh, often overlooked but hugely important element of the microbes which influence gene expression. Which was never e even considered in the Human right. Genome Project. So at that point in time then, no one was thinking about applying, there were a couple of people, but it wasn't a big thing insofar as everyone was talking about applying the tech to the microbes. We, we never even considered that. Like, right. like most things, we, we stumbled onto it th realising, look, this tech was developed to try to do human genomes, 
at the time there was a lot of sequencing capacity because the human genome projects they were all around the world global global and, and when they sort of stopped doing that and they sort of produced the first draft it was like what are we going to do with all this sequencing it's capacity a huge book, wasn't it that huge thing yeah. it was just ev- everyone so so then people realized well okay we can start using some of this and then the second generation sequencers came that you know your roches and your okay. um illuminas and your iron torrents which Roche and the Iron Torrent have disappeared now. Illumina won the battle to start off with. These came online. And as an environmental microbiologist, I was working in this area and I realised, look, if I need a career, I've got to change tack. Because this area that I'm working in is densely populated with very good scientists. And finding, like any, any scientist, you're like an artist. You need to find your creative canvas. You need to find your unique selling point. It's like any artist. Nobody wants to see somebody just pr- producing Van Goghs or producing Monets. You need that unique thing. And as a scientist, is no different. Getting back to why I moved in, it was a case of I had this toolkit that I'd helped develop or use to look at environmental situations. And at the end of the day, the gut is an environment. And the tool Full kit, of microbes. Right. And the toolkit then was the second generation sequencer. It wasn't at the time. It was just DNA based approaches. OK. It was what we called culture independent approaches. So yep. it was always this thing about you culture organisms, you miss the majority. And that mindset was carried over into the gut. And so we said, well, well what, what can we get? Stool we can get easily relatively easy. Right. 50% of stool is bacterial. Not many people think about that, but when they flush down their stool, 50% by weight is bacterial. That's a hell of a lot of bacteria. Really is it. You'd struggle to produce grams of is, bacteria. Is that right? It's yeah. 50%? 50% of wow. stool material is, is bacterial wow. biomass. It's every, a lot. Every day? Every day. And we shall talk about intestinal microbiota transfer and all that later, yeah. but that's but every day. incredible fact. It's a lot, a lot of microbes. Incredible. Um, and so we always had a ready source of bacteria and a ready source and we could extract the DNA we'd learn to extract DNA from dirty samples in other words soil because there's lots of material in there that can contaminate your DNA when you're extracting it and can mess up downstream processes you know it'll just stop things from working like DNA amplification or cloning so we'd solve that for soil and all these different wastewater treatment plants so we had the toolkit and the question is well what's actually happening in the gut because a lot of people you know if you take a gut sample and put it on a plate what you grow are the fast growing organisms the weeds as we call them you grow e coli escherichia coli so people started thinking well the large intestine is rich in e coli it's not that was the, the working hypothesis then it was and, and a lot of it a lot of the working hypothesis in microbiology were driven by culture-based approaches what can you grow on agar it's you know it's an old-fashioned method it goes back to um robert koch yeah fanny hess who yeah. people have forgotten about she was his technician who gave him the idea to move from gelatin which is very difficult to okay. use to solidify um your media your growth media okay. to agar she's not in the history books but she was instrumental to allowing us to culture but everything was driven by that the culture of axiom so you know. if we had if somebody was to gift the world uh, a book with the exact recipe for each particular plate that promoted the growth of a of a species, so we we knew it. We mm. we knew how to culture. Well. Would we use culture all the time because it gives us an advantage, or would we still be moving towards the approaches you're talking about now? It would be logistically impossible. It's the logistical element. It's a logistical element. I mean, you think you know, for a fecal sample, you might have 160 species in there. Right. Okay. In one person's gut. So right. you need 160. Well, you wouldn't need 100. You need, step, taking a step back, we think there are about a thousand different species. And every if we pulled everybody's guts in the world and analyze it, we think total is a thousand species. So if you go into somebody's gut and you don't know what's so, in there. Hold on a second. Can I just, so so, so if you, the thought experiment there is <coughs> you collect a stool sample from every person on the planet. Yeah. Analyze it. Pull it together in some sort of master cell bank yeah. thing. And then sample a heck out of it, be a very big thing. Um, And and, and each sample, let's just say, would be representative. And you're saying there'd be around about a thousand, give or take, yeah? Does this include the Amazonian tribes who may have much more? No, I think that there are only certain organisms that have uh, adapted to live in the gut. Okay. I I mean, look, you know, when I say a thousand, I wouldn't put my mortgage on it. It's not bang on a thousand. But it's It's that order of magnitude. It's that order of magnitude. Right. The total diversity is, is covered by a thousand types of organisms. But what you do is when you go to an individual, they may, out of that a thousand, they have, may, have, may have assembled 160 odd, 150 odd in their gut. Your gut will have 160, will share some, 
in terms of species names, but then you'll have your own unique ones that you've picked up over life from your natural history. So if I came in with a culture-based approach, mm. what I'd have to come in, because it's um, agnostic, I don't know what's in your gut, I have to come in with media for each of those 1,000 wow. bacteria to start okay. off with, because I don't know what I'm going to be pulling out. Okay, I see what you're saying. And so if you think then it's a 1,000 um, different media, and each sample needs at least six or seven plates, you know, 7,000, six, wow. 7,000 plates, and you've got to grow them anaerobically, in other words, in absence of oxygen, just for one person. Wow. You're, th- you know, it, it's just, that's a lot of plates when to you, A, pour. Right. <laughs> and, and, and yeah. when you it, put it like that, if you're doing some sort of experiment where you're looking at multiple different people to compare, for example, people with a disease or without a disease, then you can just multiply your 7,000 by... You know, you, you, 100 and suddenly <laughs> yeah yeah and if you want to do it over time however many time points and okay. suddenly you've got a very large room right. filled with a lot of plates right it's just not practical so and, and that also assumes that in that thought experiment that we actually know the requirements and it sounds like we don't, we don't. even today fast forward all those we still we don't. still still don't we right. still don't right 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 you know okay. a lot of organisms we just don't know and, and and unfortunately a lot of organisms don't grow in isolation they grow as consortia. They grow together. Certain organisms okay. will feed in other organisms. So if you try to split them apart, one organism may grow, but the other one may never grow. Oh, interesting. Because it, it requires a chemical from organism A wow. or a metabolite that you can't even consider. Wow. And so, it, you know, it, 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 it's impractical. So that's why another thing was it was pragmatic. We turned to the DNA-based approaches. So what the DNA-based approaches have now allowed us to do is quickly create inventories of people's stool samples. Right. Or whatever sample you want to look at. So it could be a skin swab, could be a nail swab, could be a vaginal swab, whatever it is. Could be sputum, could be um, st- you know something from the lungs, whatever it is. And if there's bacteria in it, even very low biomass bacteria, you know, when we're saying hundreds of bacteria, we will be able to pull them out and then get to a point where we can either tell you, well, we'll tell you who's there, um, most of the time we'll tell you some idea of its functions. So we can say, look, you know, this organism has these genes and we predict that these genes can do X, Y, and Z. But there's a lot of dark matter in there. And what right. I mean by that is if you look at the tree of bacterial life, I think maybe it's 120 large groups in there now. And what I mean by large groups is phylum. So a phylum is a family of organisms that share characteristics in terms of their DNA similarity, and we just clump them together. In, in microbiology, we like to cluster things. It makes e- things easier to study. And they're at the top of the tree? So like yeah, the, so the you, you go res- sort of kingdom, which is yep. bacteria, archaea, which are these old organisms, eukarya, which we're in. Right. That is, so the euca- kingdom of the eukarya has all the organisms you can think of that we're used to, that aren't microscopic. Well, even No, it's even got the microscopic organisms like your, your parasites and things like that. Anything that's usually multicellular, right. not always, fits into the eukarya. So parasites, plants, everything fits into there. That's a kingdom. Got it. And then you come down a level, which is a phyla. And so these are big families of organisms. But the problem is a lot of them still don't have any cultured organisms as representative. So all they're based on is DNA sequence, the short DNA sequence. So we have lots of families that we see, some of them in the gut, that just have nothing that's an organism you could point at in a culture collection. And what I mean by culture collection is where somebody's grown the organism to purity, so they know there's only one organism in that culture, that growth they've characterized it and then they've given it to an american culture collection the german culture collection okay. and so basically what that allows you to do as a microbiologist scientist is go back and say oh can i have that organism i'll pay you 60 pound for it because that's the idea i know exactly what that organism being described as and it'll be a representative of that family and so when we do start looking at samples we can say well there's the organism there okay it's a dna sequence however nobody's ever grown this in the laboratory right and so I can't tell you much more than saying it's related to that one over there. That one has a representative in the culture collection, and that one does X, Y, and Z. It can take sulfur, it can t- make methane. So maybe by the fact that it's a neighbour, this one might be able to do that. But unless you can pull it out as a pure culture, you're never going to be able to answer that. Interesting. So there's still a really important role to the culture. It is. It's fundamental to allowing us to phenotypically... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And also it, it closes a circle. It allows you to take an organism out and test a hypothesis. You could put it into a mouse model. Without right. the actual physical organism, you could, there's nothing to put into a mouse of model. Of course, 
You can't just put the DNA in. You right? can't put the DNA in unless you think that DNA is important. You can put it into another or, another organism right. and get it to read the DNA, right. get it to understand the functions and to produce the functions of phenotype. Right. Sometimes you can do that, but that's hit and miss. You know, that's right. a real gamble if it's going to work. Right. Right. And so basically, we're at the stage now. You know, we've we've got this great toolkit. We got these great sequences, which we hadn't anticipated and weren't designed for what we're using them for. They were designed for the human genome to go into your GP and get your right. genome done and saying, you're gonna, you're, you know, your P450 cytochrome means you're not going to react to this drug yeah. or you don't have the right receptors for this drug. Yeah. And we've, we've hijacked that to be able to sequence lots and lots of DNA cheaply from as many samples and then use that information and the bioinformatics, the com computational tools yep. to say, that's what's in your sample. That's how abundant it is. Yep. These are the functions it's making. Okay, but, so that's but, one omic. Do that's you not your DNA-based omics. But do you not need, like, if you're going to match it up to a sequence you already have, do you not need the pure culture at some point? That's, well, you... What what you do is you. you so how you, do you know what it does if you've never done you, a pure culture? That, exactly. If you you don't, you just you can try and infer it. Okay. okay. Based on similarity of. Based gene on sequence. similarities to neighbors which have right. been right. characterized. Right. Or if it hasn't, in fact, you're not even allowed to give it a, a, a bacterial name if it if there's nothing there. Okay. That's being deposited in in a culture collection. Okay. Where somebody says here's an organism. This is because there is there is rule there are rules for naming things like I can't I can't name a bacterium after myself. But there's some, I'm not allowed to. There's some people who have named so well, Harry the, Flint, for example, has what is it? Flinty bacteria. Yeah, no, but like but that. that could be one of his. It's you could if you work for me, you could name a bacterium after me. I'm not allowed to name my own bacterium after me. I can't call my name um, Marquesi. You know, but, but what a, what <laughs> well, that's have. good thing because it would prevent. Yeah. people from just With going egos, right <laughs> just going out for naming every but yeah so okay, you know, some people will honor other people by naming a bacterium after right them. i see i thought it was like so bestowed got, upon them from some society no, no, so, or something no, like no, that you know right. joel dore has got there's a doria ah okay right but, the, michael blout is yep. a blauchia so people have named G Jenner. Ah, right. But nobody, okay, nobody okay. thought I'm worthy of. Oh, right. I need to. I need to have a chat with Ben Mullish then and uh, give him a. See a nudge, can, uh, yeah. give him a. I keep saying to the lab, "Well, if you find a new organism, you know, my surname is <laughs> pronounced, but we can work on it." Marchesi, I don't know what oh, would we Marchesi. call it. Marchesi, <laughs> but it's, 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 you, you don't find much. It's it's Marchesi. Yeah. And so it's just like okay. Anyway, it's yeah. never going to happen. But. Yeah. Um, so no, and so what we then <laughs> thought about was well, look, that's one omic. Okay, right. it's an omic, you know, we call it metagenomics or metataxonomics. We have an omic, everyone loves an omic term. Right. And that gives you limited amount of information. But in the human gut, what we're really interested in is what they do and how they communicate with the host. And so that's where we have um, metabonomics and metabolomics. So these omics now, then we sort of stepped up and said, well, look, they make a load of metabolites, a load of chemicals. Before we jump into the other omics, how... <clears throat> How did the metagenomics, the things we've just been talking about in, in terms of the DNA extraction, how did they change the field during your, your initial years? So this is where we got to the stage that we realised that like, there's 150 times more genes in the, in the gut than there are in the human genome. Okay. Because they created gene catalogues, wow. and, you're, and you're suddenly looking and thinking, there's, you know, in one person's gut, there are a lot of genes that we can identify. Wow. We don't know what a lot of them do. Maybe 60, 70 percent of them are just unknown, but we can see that it looks like a gene. It has a start part. It has an end part, and it's about the right length to be a gene and make a protein. Wow. And it makes this protein, you know, we, we can translate. We have the tools that can take DNA and turn it into the amino acid sequence. And we say, right, okay, looks all right. We can try to fold it up and see what it looks like. And then we hit a brick wall. Must have been such an exciting time to realize that there was such diversity of genomic potential in yeah. there. But that's people microbes. not going a bit mad. Going, this well, is... it, it was, but it's just a case of what do we do? What can we do with it? You know, because <laughs> with a lot of these microbes, they evolve genes and we don't know their functions. You look at E. coli, even 40% of E. coli's genome, we don't know what it do, does. Really? And that's the best studied organism on Earth. Yeah, it, I mean, people knock the gene out. It doesn't seem to have an effect on growth, but you can find that gene in many E. coli. So it's... Over evolutionary history, it's been maintained, so we assume, maybe naively, that it's important to the organism, but we can't do, understand or predict what it does. And so with metagenomes, we get a lot of genes that are A, the housekeeping genes, as we call them. Those are the genes that every organism needs just to, to
to survive. Genes for DNA replication, yep. making energy, you know, the things yep. that every, every bacterium has, even our mitochondria have like, it. Like the 16S RNA. All the, all yep. the things, yeah, for making yep. proteins. You wouldn't, they, they're boring because every organism, it's, it's not the interesting thing about them. Right. And so when you do metagenomics, a lot of the genes are those housekeeping genes. Right. And so you can just park those to one side because they're just, there that every organism needs what we're usually inter interested in are things like bile processing genes <clears throat> how many organisms have the ability to take a molecule from the host modify it into something that's maybe less potent or more potent okay things that can interact with drugs right so those are you know these maybe you could call them accessory genes they're not essential to the organism yeah but they're interesting in terms of the biology of how it interacts with the host. And that drug metabolizing element, how, how has that changed in recent years? Like we're starting to appreciate that, that has, these bugs could be impacting on the effectiveness, safety, tolerability of our like medicines that are prescribed everywhere. Is I think that slowly possible? and surely that is a big revolution in pharmaceutical huge, areas. And huge. I think the big pharma companies are starting to wake up to the notion that there's this virtual organ that influences their share price. Right. It is much that, you know, A, it could affect how many people get ill. So right. nobody wants bad press, but suddenly you're thinking, well, it could be the microbes that are causing these side effects. Yeah. B, response to your drug. It could be the microbes that are dictating, A, if your pro-drug's turned into a drug and it's just active, if your drug is just degraded and it's not enough of it's been given, um, and then if it actually influences the immune system to respond to your drug. I mean, imagine if, and I don't know how we would quantify this, but imagine if a percentage of phase three failures were because the microbiome was doing something to the drug in a population that wasn't really sampled in phase two or phase one, phase one healthy volunteers, phase yeah. two slightly less sick, phase two really sick. They might have a particular microbiome profile. Imagine. Yeah. That's it, huge. I, I, I'd, I'd almost argue that you need a phase zero, which is where you do your microbe drug interaction analysis. Okay. You, you've gone through your animals, yeah. okay, to show, yeah, there's safety here. The but then you do a, a really good panel of common bacteria in the gut and ask the question how does my drug interact with the gut microbiota and you do that on the bench top you could do it on the bench yeah. top you could you could do it in mice you could do it in pigs yeah you know there's good animal models for looking at drug bug as we call it you know bacteria interaction i mean just to push back a little bit would would, would the best test though not be a patient with a disease or a form of the disease a precursor of the disease <clears throat> and very rigorous microbiome analysis in the early phase studies? Or would you want to sort of de-risk it even further? I'd want front? to de-risk it even further. The, the problem is, you know, what we know is, A, everybody has a very different gut microbiota. So choose, there's no one person who's who's a good representative of everybody's guts. Really? You might, yeah, you might need to do 100 people, which is much larger wow. than the phase one, just to take all those different, you know, try to capture all those different gut microbiota that you can have. Because if you if you look, and that's only just, the problem is that that's based on looking at stool. We don't know what happens in the small intestine. So where the drug-bug interaction happens, <laughs> right. and depending on what type of drug, let's say it's an oral drug, the first time it's going to really see the, the gut bacteria in any anger is in the small intestine. Right. Unless it's supposed to be um, absorbed in, in the stomach. Okay, in which case it'll, it'll see maybe some stomach right. bacteria. Right. But let's say it, it's gastro-coated, it gets down to the small intestine, it's released in the small intestine, that's how it's designed. Yep. It's going to see very different bacteria there than it would in the colon, doing very different things metabolically. Mm -hmm. Those are organisms that are very fast growing, they're very good at using sugars, but they have a wide range of metabolic capacity to actually interact with drugs. On the microbiome mm -hmm. similarity piece, I, I totally get how if you had a, ru a hundred random people hundreds of sample size and they're all random that there'd be big differences between them all on mm. average but is there not some sort of you're sort of almost phenotypically characterizing these patients because they've all got a disease mm. so is there not more similarity amongst them or are they do they still have that unique microbiome they still have a very unique microbiome right i mean it depends how much they've hammered their microbiome prior to coming to a doctor and start getting um, a diagnosis you know this is always a problem with case control studies where we say for example inflammatory bowel disease the person comes in and they've gone through maybe a whole host of self-medication before they get that horrible diagnosis right you have Crohn's disease you have also right. you know the, the diagnosis nobody wants because you Absolutely. know that that's a life-changing diagnosis 100%. but they've, they've changed their diet they've they gone online they tried prebiotics probiotics and also the question is when we see these individuals 
how much of the gut microbiota is in response to inflammation in the gut or something that's happening in the gut. And so what we're measuring is a response of the gut microbiota to an inflamed gut, which we know is going to be different to somebody who hasn't inflamed. And so it's very difficult then to use people who are ill as a model a lot of the time. Understood. Understood. Do you think that in the context of these diseases, and this is a big question, is it the passenger? So like, you know, is it just happening as a result of some other physiological process like inflammation? Or is it the driver? Like, is it driving the inflammation? Is it driving the disease? Like, what's your thoughts on that? And also, what work are you doing in your current lab um, to try and kind of tease out these interactions and, and answer yeah. those big questions? Well, we did have a... Many years ago, I think I'm trying to think 2007, no, 2011, sorry, we did d d look into the cancer, colorectal cancer question, and, and try to explore this passenger versus driver concept. Because at the time, the first hit, as it was called, that, that turns a benign cell in the gut into a, a tumour, a cancer cell. You know, and, and the question is, a million dollar question is, what is it? You know, because if you, if you can understand that, maybe you could control... Yeah. That, um, that that pathway of cancer, um, benign cell turning into a cancer cell tumour and all, all, the, all the, the problems that are associated with that. And there were lots of different things. Diet was one of them, you know, smoking, alcohol, whatever it is. And, of course, bacteria. Bacteria is one idea because there were good examples in the plant world of bacteria causing cancer. So there's an organism called Agrobacterium tumefaciens, which causes galls and growths on plants. Really? Yeah. And so the, for all intents and purposes, it's a cancer. Oh, wow. And so what it does, it's, it's got this small piece of DNA, largest piece of DNA, which it inserts into the plant cell and causes uncontrolled growth. Wow. And then it allows it to grow in there. What does it look like on the plant? It's just like it's some just, abnormal might, mass? Yeah, it's just, uh, no, it is like a, it's like a tumour. It's just wow. an, an uncontrolled growth on the plant, you know. Wow. It, it's no, you might have a nice stem, this big lump coming out of it, which is not that much different to what you'd see in the colon. Yeah. You know, a yeah. nice smooth one, suddenly this lump, which is going through anyway. That's so so we, we, we asked the question, driver, passenger, um, and we explored on tumour, off tumour bacterial communities and found that the tumour had a very different community of organisms to five, ten centimetres away. And this was consistent in whichever tumour we saw. And as the tumour developed... Were you scraping bits off that tumour or was it sized? And it, was, it was taking a biopsy of the tumour okay. and extracting the total DNA from it yep. and then just interrogating and looking for the bacterial DNA. Yeah, so the workflow for the patients <coughs> was maybe some symptoms, maybe... Uh, picking up some tiny specks of blood on a stool-based yeah. test that's really sensitive. They went and see the doctor. The camera went down. Yeah. The camera saw the tumour. Take a bit off. And then your lab analysed the heck yeah. out of it for what yeah. about... Right, okay. Yeah, and so yeah. We, we did that looking at um, the bacteria on it, looking at the metabolites, you know, for biomarkers. Yep. And as you can imagine, we didn't get many early stage cancers because a lot of people don't come with the Unfortunately, people come with later stage. Right. So we right. did get what's called T1, you know, the early stage right. cancer. Right. We got polyps because we were looking at people who had a history of polyps right. in their family. And they're like a precancerous change. Pre exactly, precancerous. So, and we had some healthies. So individuals, a lot who were coming in for just because they had blood in their, their stool. And so they were coming in. And as we said, we always encourage you get blood in your stool, go and see a doctor straight away. Don't, don't put it off um, and they were they were healthy so they might have had hemorrhoids or piles and that was the bleeding but we could get a healthy um, sample so we get a small group of healthy individuals and then we got people with polyps pre-cancer and then we get the different stages from T1 where it's turned into an adenoma and it's a cancer and then all the way to T4 right and we get more T4s than we did T1s because a lot of people turn up later in life and yeah. you know it's, it's a bit late then for a lot of Indeed. them oh, they will get they will some cancer survive. There's options. There are options. Yes, yeah. a, lot, a lot of surgical interventions. There's options. Options. But but what we could show is that you know as the tumors do develop, as they get larger and more aggressive and more, they've died more necrotic. You know the material inside is and they're leaking more. The community changes. And so what we were looking at to start off is we we, we identified groups of bacteria which we thought were the drivers. These were organisms that we think were interacting with the host and driving mutations and driving inflammatory environment then as the tumor developed they all fell off because the environment the local environment oh, changes okay. and then new bacteria which are adapted wow and a lot of these bacteria were oral bacteria in the colon yeah how, so, do, how does that happen so we swallow millions of bacteria every day 
they pass through, but a lot of the times they don't have a niche or a habitat which they can colonise in the in the large intestine, and so they get washed. They just go straight out the other end. Right. If you give them a tumour, some of them, for whatever reason, they like growing on it. Maybe because wow. they leak amino acids. We don't know. We don't know the full reason, but a lot of the organisms from teeth and plaque we can find on wow. tumours. What about other diseases? Do oral microbes sort of appear? And, and or is it mainly just the cancer? We've, I, I don't think I've seen it in other. We haven't seen inflammatory bowel disease. It's, it seems to be in cancer and on the tumors. And right. so that so then we thought of those as passengers. You know, so so in that that's the only example we've really looked. We haven't looked at inflammatory bowel disease. Um, we've just look, looked at it in the cancer environment. You know, whether we think that look early days there are there are drivers of inflammation. Mm. There are drivers of damage, potential damage. And then as the cancer develops, these organisms can't mm. cope anymore, they can't compete anymore, they mm. fall off and these other organisms come in. I also have read recent research that says that the bugs literally move intracellularly. Yeah. They can find their way into the actual yeah. tumour and propagate its growth through mechanisms, I think, still yeah. to be determined, which is just incredible, isn't it? But it's, it's, it's what microbes it's incredible. do. incredible. They adapt, you know, so any situation, every, every organism that we've, I think we've, we will study and ever will, can study, um, okay, I should step back and say not every organism, a lot of the organisms that we think are health-promoting, given an opportunity, they will be a pathogen. <laughs> right. You know, okay. it, it, they're all I, one I step away saying. from a being... And, and it's not like they're saying. waiting, they're sitting there. It's just the opportunity arises. I see what you're saying. And if there's the numbers there and the situation, right, they will grow in in the wrong place, whether it's, yep. you know, I, I think I mean, we mentioned before, you know, even probiotics, these health-promoting organisms, there are case studies of them called causing endocarditis. You know, people drinking lots of them. Right. Okay. And they Maybe find the bug. They find the bug. And the valves of the heart. Yeah. Wow. Wow, yeah, and wow. you know that'll be a lactobacillus. Yeah. But they, those are I'm gonna put people off using probiotics, but those are rare, rare cases. I mean, on the on the probiotics, and should we just talk about probiotics a little bit? Let's so talk about probiotics. This is the this is the <laughs> one of the topics that everyone loves to talk about. So, I'll just ask a really open question: like, what are your thoughts on probiotics? Pro, I think probiotics have a future if they're treated like a drug. I think the thing that's happened with probiotics is many of my clinical colleagues have treated probiotics and just called them probiotics. And so if they've done a study, they've thought, right, you know, I've heard probiotics are, pro th um, um, uh, are health promoting. Okay. Because by definition, they should be. By definition, they should be. WHO live definition. Live organisms, when, when given in sufficient quantities, should promote health. I'm paraphrasing yes. Colin Hill's paper. Indeed. Um, and so everything thinks, well, okay, probiotics, they, they promote health. Now, the interesting thing is, depending on which country you're in, different probiotics pr pr promote health. So in the UK, we're very much lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. Hmm. Go to Germany, you can get E. coli as a, as a probiotic. So the E. coli missile? Yeah. 1917. That's the yeah. one, yeah. I, I Why is that? Because it, it's, it's cultural. And this is the thing is, you know, right. different probiotics are, are cultural. So you go to Japan and they've got Yakult. You know, yeah, the lactobacillus casei. Yeah. And so, okay, that's still the lactobacillus, but you see the different organisms, enterococci, yeast, Saccharomyces boulardii, right. that's a yeast. You know, th that'll be in some countries. So, right. again, straight away, we suddenly say, okay, well, if, if I'm setting up an experiment where I'm using a probiotic in one country, it could be very, very different to a probiotic in another country. And so what, what tended to happen was, say, a clinician for... Good intent and good purposes would say, I want to study a probiotic in the context of my disease. Yep. So they would just go and grab a probiotic, a random one maybe off the shelf or they've right. seen, you could buy, you know, and I'm going to give it to my patients in a randomized clinical trial. Double, I'll do all the right things as if it was a drug. Yep. But the problem is I've just taken a generic probiotic. Right. They've not selected one based on a particular phenotypic property. Exactly. You yeah. wouldn't do that for a drug. You wouldn't go to your ethics committee and say, right, well, I'm going to treat inflammatory bowel disease. What are you going to use? Drug. Yeah, but which one? Drug. I'm just going to use drug. I'm going to take the random drug off the shelf over right. there. Right. And I'm going to give it to my patients. But hold right. on a minute. You've just chosen, um, I don't know, a, a chemotherapeutic. Yep. I just chose drug. Yeah. yeah, but that's not going to help your patient. They're going to get very ill on that. Right. Okay, I'm just. And so what happened was lots of trials with probiotics turned out to be negative. So right. probiotics got a bad press. Right. Now, if they had come, you know, if, if they had gone to the ethics committee and said, right, I'm taking lactobacillus reuteri because I have this cell data that shows this 
dampens down IL-1 beta, TNF alpha. It it works in a mouse model, and you know I've, I've got a, a colitis mouse model, and it, it dampens down that. So I've got yeah. a very good evidence that it's specific, and it's not just saying like the possessor Reuter. You need the strain. So it's a mechanistic <coughs> workup. To say this say, is why this is this is work. the reason this is the rationale for choosing not just saying I'm choosing probiotics and I'm going to just randomly take one so going forward I think probiotics have a place if they're treated like a drug okay you need evidence that yep. it works yeah building up to a phase one yeah you must we don't need the phase one because a lot of them are generally regarded as safe anyway yeah Okay, and unless you can give me huge doses, and then that's another story. But then you, you know you might be able to go into a phase two A or something like that, and say, well, look, you know, we'll take fifty fifty. We're going to treat these patients over time. Here, are my, my primary outcome, my secondary yep. outcome, and we can see if it works. So, a couple of questions for you: <clears throat> single strains. Do you think they're based on what you talked about earlier? Some bugs need other bugs to sort of come to life, if you like, or to grow in a culture plate talking about hundreds of different species in the microbiome in every patient. So that's an ecosystem. Is a single strain really going to have a demonstrable effect when it's such a complicated system it's going into? If you think about the site of action, the problem that we've got is our, our perception of the human microbiome is driven by stool in right. the gut. Right. And a lot of these lactobacilli don't get the, the large intestine in appreciable numbers but they get to, to the small intestine in appreciable numbers. Okay. So they could, you could load up the small intestine with 50% of these lactobacilli. So, okay. And if you think of the small intestine as maybe being more immunologically active, right. you know, it's sensing more compared right. to the, the large intestine is quite boring, really. You know, look, you know better than I do that the large intestine, some of its, its roles are to pull water back out. It doesn't have many payers patches, if any. It doesn't do much when I say about, you know, for sampling and seeing what's happening. A lot of fermentation goes on in there, and a lot of important chemicals are made there. But in terms of immunology, the small intestine is where it's at. So if your um, bacterium is a lactobacilli and you're taking 100 million of them, 200 or a billion of them, then that's going to have an impact in the small intestine. Right. So, it, you know, you, you could bulk up that small intestine by... 30, 40% is going to be this organism, it'll grow a couple of times and then, then it'll die out and get washed out. So it could have an impact in the small intestine. And that's right. where we're very poor at understanding yeah. how these organisms interact with the host in the small intestine. And we're poor at understanding because it's so hard to study, right? It's yeah. like, because we, I mean, how, how do we study it? What do we need to do? So early days, we study patients who had ileostomies, so holes in the side. Right, and so we it's could coming get, out. Yeah, into a bag and into a yeah. bag, and you could sample that. So it yeah. was pre going into the yeah. um, large intestine. So that, but then there are a unique cohort of patients, and right. the question is: Is this small intestine representative of healthy individuals? And I guess the question for you or the field would be: You know, they've got an ileostomy, okay, so maybe they don't have a large colon because it's been removed. Yeah, yeah. Does that impact on the small intestine microbiome? Exactly. And you know, there's, there's, there's a whole load of things. So those were the early forays into it because they you could get small intestinal um, samples. Then groups like Willem de Vos's in Holland got ethics to do healthy individuals and, and put a scope down the nose and into the small intestine okay. and start sampling there. But they were very small groups. But it gave us an insight that the small intestine was very different. Right. And so to get to the small intestine, you don't, you can't sort of ask a hundred people, uh, would you be willing to be scoped? And it, it's not pleasant. I don't know if you've had it or not. I haven't. No. I've had small scopes put down. I've watched nose. it. Yeah. It's, um, um, and it, and it, oh, I mean, of course, you know, it's. I think it just feels really unnatural because it is. You know, how, is. how often would we have, over time had big tubes stuck yeah. there. No, and just, there's risk associated with something like that. There is. You know, and, and if, if you is. want to do a longitudinal study where the patient's coming back 10 times, to have that tube put down 10 times, yeah, it's not pleasant. So so it, it becomes very difficult. But that being said, you know there are companies who are producing engineering solutions. So yes. there's a company in Canada that, that we work with called Nimble Science who have a little capsule that, that you can swallow. Oh, okay. And it opens up a different... You, know, you can you can follow it. It's like a little robot? Yeah, so it just opens... Oh, oh, scoop. Back yeah, in. opens up and and it samples maybe a hundred microliters, wow. shuts up, um, preserves it, and then when you poop it out, hopefully you catch it and you don't flush it away. But you poop it out. Of course, you need right. You need to okay, recover it. Okay, interesting. You need to recover Very it. Very so, interesting. I was just about to say that. Where does it go? But of course, yeah. it goes there. 
Okay. As long as you've got no no strictures or anything in your gut right. to allow it. I think they might give you um, a proxy beforehand to show that, that you, you... That would make sense. Yeah, and I think a couple of them do that. But S- So we're innovating and we're... But we generally are. speaking, what, what are the the high level differences then between the small bowel and the big bowel in terms of microbes? Like, what have we found? So the, the small bowel is much more dynamic for obvious reasons because it gets fed really three times a day with a high energy diet. Yeah. Which the large intestine doesn't. The large intestine gets a trickle of poor energy source material. In other words, lots of carbohydrates that you can't utilise. Whereas the small intestine gets lots of sugars, lots of fats, lots of proteins. And so the organisms there are much more adapted to grab sugars and grow quickly. And so what you get are things like lactobacilli, enterococci, E. coli, um, streptococci, vianella. These organisms that are very good at metabolising sugar and growing quickly. But it's also lower density because it moves quickly. So these right. organisms are fast growing because they need to grow quickly to maintain the, their um, presence in the gut. Makes sense. But then things move through quite quickly. You know, the transit through the small intestine is much faster than the large intestine. And so it doesn't lend itself to produce dense, complex communities. So there are fewer organisms there. It's not as dense and it's a lower abundance of them. Got it. Okay. And what about functional properties have we done much on that or are they very similar um no they are no the the, the fermentation you know does happen in the small intestine you do get these short chain fatty acids being produced but i don't think that i think we haven't had much um luck in really analyzing it in full detail because it's difficult to get to um got it let's make a mental note to talk or or talk about this in the context of fmt imt later because i think it's super interesting now back to probiotics i'm sure as a professor and I like a, an expert in the microbiome. People ask you all the time, Julian, which probiotics should yeah, I take? Yeah. How much should I take it? Should I try this? Should I even take probiotics? I get it too. Yeah. And I'm very often seeing the kind of same thing, which is, look, I don't take them um, for these reasons. And I would spend my money on the best food I can possibly afford. Yeah. What do you say? I say exactly the same thing. I Do think you? It, 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 <laughs> That's good. That's reassuring. Well, no, it, yeah. it also comes down to, you know, it, it, it's the same thing with vitamins. You know, the yeah. more and more we see is a yeah. majority of people who don't take vitamins aren't walking around with rickets, scurvy, berry, berry, all the deficiencies that you used to see. Yeah. Because our food is, is, is reinforced with it. We're getting enough vitamins. Okay. Yeah. Probiotics, again, for the healthy individual... There must be no need for it. Yep. Where they do come into their own is if you say you've had a course of antibiotics, yep. okay, and you might have had a bit of diarrhea from it, then that there's, there's no harm in taking probiotics there. Which ones? It's a good question because a lot of probiotics don't contain what they say on the label. Some companies are better than others. Okay. You know, and, and I'm, I'm not on commission to any, with anybody, but for example, Yakult. You know, I, I've opened a bottle of Yakult and we have grown the bacteria from there and it is what it says is on there. Okay. That's good. Danone, the same. You know, if they say those little Danone says it's got X amount of um, lactobacillus casei in it, generally it is that organism. There's nothing else in there. We work with a company called Cultec who make something called Lab P4 and Lab 4 for boots. I've opened that up and it has got in okay. what it is. So there are some companies that do. But how do you select? Like, because what you're talking about is you've got la- yeah. lacto, saccharomonies, E. coli nissel, some have a blend. Like, what what should you do? And I think the antibiotic case is good. In Italy, they give probiotics. VSL3 after, and things yes, like that, they, which is a mix of they, probiotics. They, they, they yeah. do, fer- ferring VSL3. I mean, that's the one that I would typically recommend because there's a lot in it. There is a lot in, and that way you're hedging your bets, right? And that's the problem is, you know, the just taking one, it's well, what is it doing, and and is it fit for what you want it to do, right? So, without testing it, I, I would hedge my bets. You know, VSL three or the Lab four P, which has got four organisms in yeah. it, you're yeah. covering your bases are sort of sort of there, yeah. and 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 it's a difficult one. It is. I don't think we're at the stage where we we're going to be getting prescribed probiotics by the GP for Indeed. something at the moment because the it, evidence isn't strong enough at it, the moment in the absence of data so thought experiment if you had every option available to you including for example banking your own microbiome before you got antibiotics hmm. or taking a sample that had been derived from a super healthy person um or kind of any specific strain or consortia what would you what would you ideally want to have like where should the industry and the researchers be shooting for for post-antibiotic use i like the banking your own 
Yeah. Because uh, it, it's interesting, you, you mentioned that super healthy donor. Yes. So we've got projects where we're looking at liver disease. Yes. Um, and maybe Ben will talk about it later, you know. And we, we, we're talking about transplanting microbiota from healthy individuals yep. into people who have liver disease, fatty liver disease, and seeing if we can change their yep. chemical and metabolic landscape. Now, when we decided who should we be choosing as a healthy donor, I argued we should be choosing somebody like myself in their mid-50s, in their 60s, okay, who have not abstained from alcohol over life, I wouldn't say abused it, but not abstained, you know. Um, okay, not clinically obese, yeah. but and has good liver function. Yep. Um, I see where that, you're going with this. And, let, and let, a good fibre scan score, say. So yep. my liver's not stiff. It's about 4.5. So it's nice and wobbly, my liver. It's not too stiff. But what that tells me is maybe I have a gut microbiota that it's protective. is protective. However, if you take a 20-year-old who can do a triathlon in two hours or less... Okay, when you pick them up at 60, you might find that actually they've got fatty liver disease, yeah. they've gone obese, and yep. actually their microbiota was not protected yep. just because they look hale and healthy now. Yeah, is and this is the one thing we can never predict yep. what is a healthy microbiota because it's all context dependent. Yeah, so go in if you, you know, if you could fast forward and take a time machine and look at them in 40 years' time and say, no, their liver's still good, so let's say that actually that is a protective microbiota. And that's the sort of one we want to transport. So interesting because the, the the guidelines the the guidelines that Ben was first author on yeah uh, a bit of joint joint first author I think yeah, actually with, 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 yeah yeah absolutely um one of my there's a lot in there we can talk about we could talk about yeah. so much in there actually like they have some sort of they have lots of exclusions that are theoretical yeah right yes um, but uh, I suppose one of them is you know there's a cutoff. I think it's 60, hmm. maybe 65. There's there's a, that ballpark really is what I see typically in FMT protocols and, and guidelines. And by the way, if you don't know what FMT is, it's the movement of microorganisms from one person into another. And that, Fecal microbiota transplant. That's it. And, and the microbes are derived from stool. And there's various protocols, procedures, systems, checks and balances to make sure that that material, which is the starting material for what goes into a person, is as safe as... Yep. as it can possibly be based on our current understanding. And there's a mixture of pathogen screening through analytical methods, yep. but also a whole variety of questionnaire-based exclusions. Lifestyle questions. Yeah, and we're speaking specifically right now about age. And it's like, I, I have pushed back a little bit and said, well, if someone's 85 and they look incredible yep. and, and, and their biochemistry and everything is phenomenal, <clears throat> they've never had antibiotics veggie diet with 100 grams of fiber every yeah. day and they're running marathons okay that's certainly like a pretty good donor yeah. Yeah. right but they'd be they'd be cut out yeah whereas your 25 year old who's just come back from i napa i know yeah you know what i'm talking about yeah, yeah just yeah. Been living off red bull that that uh, red chips. bull and vodka and chips <laughs> yeah 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 maybe some promiscuous behavior um uh, likes to go out with the lads maybe had a couple of cigarettes over there but nothing too much you know it's like okay so I they know. would they would yeah. qualify, but somebody else wouldn't. So yeah. that's why I think there's a there's a huge amount of art and knowledge and know how in donor selection. I agree with you totally. So important for I think, this. I think it did this falling down. It, it, it's an easy trap to fall into saying somebody's young, they must be healthy. No, no. what's their life trajectory? Yes. Where are they going to go? That yes. For all you know, they could hit 40, 50 and have colorectal cancer. Yeah. So what you've just done is transplanted potentially if we buy into it yeah. a microbiota that could be carcinogenic it, it, or pro-cancer supporting indeed but there's checks and balances there as well there's the, f the fit testing for blood in the stool and then there's a first degree relative exclusion on if you have a first degree relative of colorectal cancer i'm afraid you can't be a donor so we but try. let's say you take those out mm. unless you're going to follow that individual sure you know we we ask about mental health psychiatric yeah. problems yeah but all the, i just but but going back to your point about yeah. and i think it is a valid point that a lot of the things that we do speculate on being a gut yes. microbiota driving it at yes. the moment the evidence is very mouse driven very weak it's weak it? and so you know are we are we Indeed. excluding a lot of good donors based on what we thought is oh my gosh this this may happen this may happen this may happen yeah. saying well where are the bodies you know it, it's that sort Indeed. of thing is if, if you're going to exclude you really yep. need strong evidence exclude on pathogens they're clear for sure for sure and and being as Robust and rigorous as we possibly can on pathogens, I think is 
totally fundamental. But as, as we know Indeed. from 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 the was it 2019? 2018-19, yeah. the, the the Philippe paper. Yeah, yes. the two individuals yes. who were given. Hopefully, I've done their name uh, the 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 right kind of pronunciation there. But indeed, but two individuals. Immunocompromised. E. coli bacteremia. Yeah, one yeah. died. One died, yeah. yeah. And but, but interestingly, that was because they hadn't followed the procedures. Indeed. And, you know, and, and I think Ben and Nabil's um, uh, protocol then would have caught that because they yes. did have ESB. It did have yes. antibiotic-resistant bacteria, yeah. E. coli, as a... <clears throat> so... I mean, and we're going even <clears throat> further at enterobiotics yeah. in terms of the sensitivity of the assays, yeah. the frequency of the testing, and just the overall kind of hierarchy of checks, balances, and controls yeah. to reduce risk and, and, and increase the assurance at each stage. And ultimately, <clears throat> I think that if we're going to be doing this type of approach at scale, and I really mean at scale, I'm not mm. talking 10 people, I'm talking like hundreds of thousands of millions yeah. of people, we must have those checks and balances yeah. in place and we must be absolutely robust and rigorous on all elements associated with starting material safety. Now, going back a step, um, what did you do for this liver study? Who won the, the debate? Did So are, are people like well, yourself who've had a couple of drinks or so on and so on? I suppose I mean, we can't just have it abstinent donors. Is that no, really the No, I think that's impractical. I mean, at, at what we fell back on the, on the state... A state of the, we fell back... We fell back to using metabolic profiling to decide on our donors. Oh, you're, you're doing that? Yes. This is interesting. I've never... never I've only seen microbial driven selection yeah. in liver populations. The um, short chain fatty acid producers, yeah. essentially, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. So this is, so this, this is looking at really these are the healthy individuals metabolically. They they sit in this area of mm-hmm. of the graph. Here are fatty liver disease. Pro Ben for this later. He'll he'll have much more. I will do. I'll I'll, I'll make a note to do. We should also, while we're here, talk about the metabolomic toolkit because we spoke about the metagenomics. Yes. Yeah. And maybe before we jump into this, so what what is the metabolomic toolkit? What is metabolomics? And so, as I mentioned before, we're very good at DNA based approaches. I think you know we've got to the stage now that everything we do with DNA based approaches is is incremental. There's nothing sort of revolutionary coming down the line with tweaking this changing that right but what we've realized or our group my group has realized and we, we're studying is that in a healthy individual the communication between your microbiota the organisms that live in and on you is predominantly via the metabolites and the proteins they make so whilst we're not very good at looking at the proteins um, and that's more technical and it's more information based problem that we should be able to solve later down the line, we're pretty good at extracting the, the chemicals they make, the metabolites, analysing those and determining then, because we can buy them, what they do. You know, we can incubate them with some cells, we can incub- put them into an animal, we can put them into animals then with genes knocked out and see, well, if that receptor's missing, does the animal respond to this um, chemical? And that's how, you know, we find out things like short-chain fatty acids have their own receptors, and those receptors then are found all across the body, and they, right. they're fundamental to mammalian biology right and so these metabolite profiling methods called metabolomics and metabonomics are the tools that we use and, and they, they're, they're very um, powerful methods that we can apply to longitudinal studies over time yeah. case control studies so two groups you know with yeah. and without disease or with and without an intervention and we can take plasma we can take urine we can take fecal water which is feces bulked up with water and just filtered um, we can take swabs and we can just look at the metabolites in there and we can look at lipids we can look at small molecules yeah we can look at a whole range of complex molecules and so and that's that's where we that's what we really do with the lab at imperial and that, that's and, and mick and then we sort of associate that with the bacteria there and try to make the connections right. between them so you think that the things that they produce um might be more important than just their presence Right. Yeah, I think yeah. it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and the interesting thing is, you don't need much of some organisms, so they could be very low oh, level of right. organisms. You don't have to have it. You know, it doesn't have to be ninety percent. Fascinating. It can be point zero 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 one percent in your gut. Fascinating. But it can have a significant impact, making organi- um wow. metabolites that accumulate, yeah. and then just switching on genes left, right, and centre. So, what are the kind of big buckets of metabolites that bugs produce that we think might be uh, important? So. 
the one you've mentioned already, the short-chain fatty acids, we now think there are four of them that were important. The, the, it used to be the trinity, acetate, propionate, butyrate. We've added to valerate to that. And they're named based on how many carbons are... Yeah. Yeah. So acetate, two carbons, yeah. propionate, three, butyrate, four, got and it. valerate, five. And they, I mean, they've got proper chemical names that give you a clue, like valerate is the generic, yeah. but it's called pentanoic acid, and penta got it. is five. So we started with, sorry, three... Then it became four, and now your group has done some work to say actually maybe it's five or it could. Well, be no, more. no, it's it, we started with three, yep. acetate, propion, and butyrate. That's the trinity that you see a lot of write up. But we think the valerate's now important. Yeah, and you've done some very elegant work <clears throat> in what I'll call reverse engineering, or yep. I guess another phrase could be <clears throat> elucidating the mechanism of action. Yep. For an FMT in C diff. Yep, which was in the news yesterday. I did not see that. Yep. Nice have said that... Oh, yes, 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 yes. The BBC yes, covered I, I, a Guardian yes, picked up on it. Yes, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. And actually, they did mention about superbugs and antibiotic resistance, which uh, is interesting. No, I know Nice uh, released updated guidance with a recommendation yeah. for the use of FMT and recurrency diff. I didn't realise they mentioned anything about Valerie, did they? No, no they right, didn't, okay, no, but right. it was the it was, fact that it just hit, it, you know, it got into the headlines. I was surprised as well. But it got all into, over the BBC, all, all over the Metro, yeah, everything. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of people picked up, well, a lot of, lot of um, news yep. outlets picked up. Fantastic. Yeah. So that was great, yeah. Really, really good And to so see. we've used this FMT as, as a tool to understand the role of the microbiota in the host because it's, it's one of the only times that we're allowed to totally transplant somebody's microbiota and change it. It's difficult to take a group of individuals and say, we'll give them antibiotics for no reason. Mm. But this is a, an opportunity so people who are sick, yep. we can actually just modify the gut microbiota quite dramatically by putting somebody else's microbiota in there. I mean, it probably is the most dramatic. <clears throat> it is, has yeah. to be, right? Well, apart from bariatric surgery. Oh, okay. Which is super dramatic that's the other really? Re really interesting experiment that we're allowed to do well say allowed to do if people uh, are undergoing indeed. gastric bypass oh wow especially where they you know they bypass the stomach the rue on y gastric yeah, bypass yeah, which is yeah. the gold standard yeah that oh my gosh that changes your large intestine it's wow in, into a small intestine basically micro really microbiologically it really 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 alters it so that's, Whoa, that's the other one. So this is there are a couple, fascinating. You know. Well, hold on a second. So, <clears throat> so this bariatric surgery is phenomenally good yeah. at reducing people's body weight. Yeah. So there's definitely a sort of ca physical capacity piece, isn't there? Where you oh gosh, yes, yeah. You, but, you bypass the stomach, so you're not taking as much food in. Yes. The stomach's still there. Okay. In situ, it's still there, yeah. but it's not plumbed into your small intestine. So do you know there's a company... That, and I don't know if it's still going, and I'm sorry to the company if they're doing really well. They were giving capsules containing oxygen to people. I look at your face. <laughs> I'm just trying to work this out. Okay. I, I hope I'm not. I'm an empty capsule. <laughs> I hope I'm not doing them a disservice, okay? But hear me out. So what I think what they were saying, or the hypothesis, and again, apologies to the company from doing you a disservice, was you do this bariatric surgery. And there's more aerobes which appear in your gut where they weren't before. And their hypothesis was that it was the aerobe change, the shift in whatever it was that was driving suppression of hunger and so on, so on, so on, so on. So I think they were literally giving a capsule that, okay, we shall say no more on the matter, but I just thought it'd be very interesting. Yeah, so, yeah. so how much of this effectiveness against, you know, obesity is driven by the physical bit or is there a microbial bit as well? There's definitely, obviously, the physical bit. The calorie restriction is no-brainer. Right. You know, people keep saying obesity, you know, how do you do it? Well, it, it is thermodynamics. It's, it's kind of... It is simple yeah, thermodynamics. It's not that. People don't yeah. make fat from nothing, okay? Yes. If you take a mammal and stop feeding it for a day, it yes. starts losing weight. You know, I know, and, and I'm not trying to trivialise no, obesity. I hear you. But at the end of the day, it is energy in, energy out. Yeah. It is a simple thermodynamics... So, the question Stopping for you... Stopping the energy in is difficult. That's exactly what I was about to okay. ask you, so I'm really because, glad we've you know, arrived there. One of the things we don't seem to, to f be... We don't want to do is hold the, the food company's feet to the fire yeah. and say, actually, this is big problem that you've caused Indeed. by the foods that you produce that are obesogenic, yes. that are cheap. Low fibre. Low fibre. Micronutrient light, all, all that stuff. Thing, ultra processed foods that yep. taste great, cheap, and yep. actually... A driving this. So that aside, 
Okay, and I'm not going to point to any companies. They're all but as guilty as each other. We do need to talk. Sorry, just I did, we need to make a note. I would love to pick your brains on the communication between the gut and the brain and are, are the bugs adapting to these foods and going, hey, um, we want some more of that? And, that's and, a good question. You I know? Mean, I don't know enough about the... You want to get somebody like Kevin Whelan or Gary Frost in? Yeah. Those Kev, two guys, Kevin's on, on my Kevin short will, list. He's a he, very he, interesting he's guy. He's good because he knows about his emulsifiers. He knows yes. about all the stories there about that. So he'd be better. I, I don't know if the gut microbes... Are adapting to them. Maybe small intestine. I don't know. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Wouldn't, wouldn't put putting money on it at the moment. Because some people get. You know, so, some people think that cravings for chocolate and sugar. You know, there's there's some sort of neuronal cellular yeah. stuff circuitry stuff that's going on here. However, it might be that the bugs go. Where's that gone? Yeah. I want some of that. Yeah. And they produce because we. My understanding is that on the metabolomic side. We haven't characterised anywhere near all of the products of microbial oh, metabolism. No, no. no. So there's, there's a lot of unknowns. There's so, a lot of unknowns. So they might be through. sending signals, molecules they produce that that trigger some yeah. sort of craving in the brain for sugar. Yeah. It kind of makes sense, right? Yeah. Now going back a step on the short chain fatty acids. So, is it the case that there's some sort of kind of co-evolution thing here where we eat something that's rich in fibre? And our digestive enzymes in the upper part of the GI tract can't break it down. Hmm. And then it arrives in there as a food source and they hmm. go, mmm, yummy. They eat it and then they produce something that benefits us. Is that what we're seeing? Or? Definitely. I mean, if you think of the the, the range of um, functions the short-chain fatty acids do, they're anti-inflammatory, anti-proliferative, so they cut down your risk of getting colorectal cancer. They um, may help, help with your mental health. All the sort of things that may allow you to last wow. a little bit longer, reproduce and pass on the genes to the next generation and the microbiota. You know, these, are going, these microbiota will be maternally transmitted. So if it's if it's a group of organisms... So say that again, sorry, they're maternally transmitted, so they're coming from mum. Predominantly, yeah. If, if you outside of the... If we're going back hundreds of thousands of years, the only place they've been coming from is from mum in natural birth. Yeah, okay. The early life microbiome you're talking about, because yeah. there's no C-sections. Or, no C-sections. Yep. So, that, so <clears throat> those microbiota that were interacting with the diet, benefiting the host in terms of health, Mm. allowing them to have more children, right. reproduce, that microbiota then becomes like a genetic information that is transmitted to the next generation. Right, right, right. And so, so I, of, course, of course I see a, an interaction. It's, it's a right. win-win for both. You know, the microbiota has a nice home to live in. It gets fed things it likes to eat and at the same time produces metabolites that the host responds to, whether it's bile acids that help with driving, um, minimizing obesity or gathering energy from food as it comes in, whatever it is, down to neurotransmitters that make the host feel happy, to short-chain fatty acids that are anti-inflammatory and also protective against foodborne organisms coming in and killing the host. All those come together, you know, without all the other parts that we don't know about. Just those simple players there, they all play a role in host health. Amazing. So there's this element of we kind of know what we need to do to be healthier in terms of eating, dietary habits, so on. And But what's actually happening is we're feeding this orchestra. Yeah. And it just starts playing this incredible symphony, symphony. And all the things that it's producing in its theatre of activity, or not all of them, but many of them are actually benefiting us. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're now starting to define why these foods actually make yeah. us better and reduce yeah. the incidence of disease and so on and yeah. so on. And it's the what you're saying is it's metabolomics that's giving us that insight, yeah? At the moment, that's where, where our um, uh, effort and concentration is, but the proteins will come to the fore. You know, we'll understand some of the proteins they're making. Yeah. And the reason we're not really at, the, at that point is because, as I said, it's, it's just a technological. The proteins... Are, what happened? Uh, they degrade fast? No, it's, it's, it's more to do with identifying them. Okay. This goes back to the fact that identifying a protein relies on very well annotated bacterial genomes. And if we're not annotating those very well, because we either don't have the full genome, we can't come back. Our protein just comes back as an unknown again. Mm-hmm. Let's, like I said before... 60 to 70 percent of genes coming from a gut are unknown right. it's the same sort of thing with proteins we just see a protein and say, well there's, there's nothing in the database that tells us what that protein does right 
Right. Um, okay. You know, I'm, I'm not saying it's, it's super better with metabolites. We still, as you as you mentioned, you know, a lot of metabolites we see them, the structures, and we think, oh, I didn't, well, I have no idea what that is. Wow. So that could be a cure for something. Yeah. And there's a paper published in Nature a couple of days ago. Um, they were mining the microbiome to find antimicrobial solutions to, I think, Pseudomonas. Yeah. I don't know if it was Anginerosa, the one that predominates in cystic fibrosis. Yeah. I can't remember. Uh, but my take home was, right, the cure might be residing inside of us. Yeah. The cure to all these things might be in that, whatever it is, two million yeah. genes that sits yeah. within all of our gut. I mean, that, that is incredible. That is interesting about microbes is, I think, Craig Venter, the guy who yeah. was involved in the human genome. Incredible entrepreneur, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and many, many years ago, he says, I'm, I'm stopped looking at um, mammalian genomes. They're boring. Because every time I sequence them, I don't find anything new. Whereas bacterial genomes, every environment we go to, yeah. we keep adding to the list of new genes. Incredible. It hasn't plateaued at the moment. Incredible. It's, it's, you know, some people think it's almost like an infinite um, resource of genes in the, in the microbiome. Incredible. Because when I say the microbiome, I'm talking about the Earth's microbiome. Yeah. Because, you know, a yeah. lot of people forget that below the sea floor... There's a microbiome. It, it, well, it's the majority of biomass. You know, 10% of the world's biomass is below the sea floor and it's bacterial. That's a lot of really? biomass. Yeah, it's a lot of biomass. Wow. And you've got these bugs which are extremophilic, so they can live in these vents that are like 135 degrees yeah. Celsius. Yeah. And that level of adaptation, you know, it just exemplifies how phenomenal these microbes actually yeah. are. I was, I was in the um, House of Parliament just the day before Boris Johnson resigned. Okay. okay. It's a great story, this, because we were going to go into our room right. for an all part, part, yes. part of the special thing we jig on yeah, the. Uh, and, and there's a definitely a more technical term of thing we jig, isn't there? Yeah. So have a <laughs> all party parliamentary group, <laughs> yes, APPG. Yes, 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 yes. And we couldn't get into our room because Boris had hijacked it for a meeting. So really? he came out, we went in, and, and they were asking me, you know, antibiotic resistance. Yeah. It, will we solve it? And I said, it's solvable. Yeah. Okay, because microbes make so many antibiotics. Yeah. The problem is not finding them. The problem is an economic. That's why Lord O'Neill was brought in yes. to try to find an economic solution to... And it, it was a, a good one. Okay, but it's right. not happened yet. Not happened no. yet. But a pharmaceutical company putting in £2 billion to develop a drug yep. that then sold for £5 yep. and then goes out of use after a year yep. because it becomes it's antibiotic not, resistance. Not so, one, so, yeah, I think you're right. The solution is there. Could be there. In the gut, soil, marine, yep. coral, wherever it is. Yeah, yeah. Well, um... When I become Prime Minister, I'll make sure that we've got proper, <laughs> proper pool incentives for antibiotics. <clears throat> yeah. You know, we it's too short-sighted to not be investing massively in novel antimicrobial solutions because it will hit us and it will hit us so hard and, and everyone's yeah. going to say, what were you people doing? Where was the recommendations yeah. and the infrastructure? Music? Well, we, had, we knew... But we just didn't have the appropriate resources and, and available the from the it's government. It's a global problem. I remember writing to my MP Very years much. ago saying, look, the organisms in India don't care about boundaries. So if antibiotic resistance right. pops up in that country or in the UK, whatever it is, it's going to move globally. Yeah, I and mean, we're, we're, seeing, we're seeing it, though. We've seen it with COVID, how, you know, how quickly COVID. things move yep. globally. And, and there are people out there, I understand, um, through discussions with infectious disease clinicians, there are people out there who have untreatable gonorrhea right now. Yeah. They cannot yeah. treat it. So it's now lifelong until someone comes up with something really novel to get rid of it. That and, is and, scary. And it's scary because then there's a lot of people using antibiotic prophylactically. Very scary in, indeed. In, in groups. You know, Very scary. And you know, they'll buy it illegally over um, the web. I understand. Use Self-treating. It. Self-treating. And then they, you're thinking, gosh, how many SDIs are going to start in, popping up? Indeed. No, Julian, absolutely. And it's still very much a... Uh, we're taking a very broad brass approach yeah. to treat, treating something that we could treat very specifically with precision, for example, yeah. phage and so on. So um, things I'm really keen to talk about uh, with the remainder of the time, more on FMT. Yeah. Let's also talk about the other elements of the microbiome, the microbiome. Yeah, the, the fungi. Vi the fungi. The yeah. viruses. The viruses, yeah. It's a community. So They all come together to, to form the community. Yeah. Now, fungi are interesting because... Many years ago, we looked into this on the back of the fact that the paper had been published that said the mouse gut is full of fungi. So we thought, oh, okay, that, that, that's novel. You know, there's, there's a picture of um, all these different organisms. Okay, so we looked at the human gut and we didn't find many. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, it was a stool sample, but we found very, very few. So what we did is we tried to grow them. So okay. we tried a dual approach. 
culture independent again, DNA based, yeah. targeting fungi and those organisms, and a culture based approach. Try to grow something from stool. And what we did is we when we did the culture based approach, we grew your candidas, your candida albicans, your saccharomyces cerevisiae, your baker's yeast. And if we did the culture independent, they were very, very low abundance. They were very low. And we found some organisms, one called Blastocystis hominis. Oh, I know about this. Now, it's interesting. Tell me. Well, it's interesting because Blastocystis hominis, I think, has got a bad press. <clears throat> and well, as I, you know, some <clears throat> guidelines for donor screening for FMT yeah. say if you've got Blastocystis in there, sorry, but they can't be a donor. And there's also the other <clears throat> one, which is Fragilis. Uh, but... uh, no, yeah, um... I can't remember the name yes, of it. Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, 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 yes. Um, well, so we'll, ask, we'll ask Ben when he comes yeah, on. Yeah, Blastocystis hominis, I think, is like E. coli. I think lots of people have it in their gut. Some people have it as a parasite. But, I, I mean... I, I, oh, yes, is it de- deentamoeba fragile? No, I... I, I oh, don't, it, no, it could be a... Uh, it could be an entamoeba. Yeah, I can't remember. Anyways, we'll, we'll get Ben on and we'll, we'll interrogate the, the uh, but, lead co But, co-op. you know, and, and, and we found like, uh, in this Irish, because I was in Ireland at the time, this Irish yeah. population that nearly everybody of, of the 30 or 40 people had, had blastocystis hominis, but they were all healthy. Wow. And I thought, it, it's like having E. coli in your gut. It can be and it can But it's be. the strain. And ah. the problem was the literature, a lot of people had published blastocystis hominis papers in parasite journals. So straight away it had this name above it, it's a parasite. Right. And yet I think it's um, a commensal eukaryote, right. not a fungi, right. but a eukaryote. Yep. So a complex organism that happens to live in lots of people's guts and in some people, just like E. coli, if it was 0157, it will cause a problem, diarrhea. But in most people, they just carry it, doesn't affect them whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. And um, I mean, with regards to donor screening and such like, I guess this is another example of we're taking perhaps an overly cautious approach because we don't yet truly know, right? So how important then are the fungal elements and the phage and content? The phage are fundamental to the gut microbiota. Okay, yep. the fungi I think are much more opportunistic. Again, hit them with some antibiotics. If you've got HIV and you're immunocompromised, yep. um, then they have opportunities to grow and cause problems. Basically, most of the time, fungi don't cause a problem. Yeah, I hear people. Some people say I've got a candida overgrowth. Um, so and so, my health person, whoever they've gone to see their health guru, told them, told them what you got is candida. No, it's not, it's candida. And you mostly haven't, you know, this candida albicans thing, this, this, it, I don't buy into it. Right, right. Okay, it, it'll pop up in certain situations, you know, thrush, we understand that. Right. Oral thrush, like, you know, when I was younger, we were given antibiotics and sugar solutions. Right. And it used to stick around the mouth right. and cause oral thrush because right. the organism, the bacteria were depleted and an opportunistic fungus would be allowed to grow but for the majority of people we we rarely see any issues with with candida now or i'm um, fungi now that's not to say that there aren't situations where it can become invasive it could become a problem but i think those are far and few between now the viruses every one bacterium in in the gut has 10 viruses trying to predate it so viruses are whoa <clears throat> the most abundant organism on earth is it really a one to ten and, ratio? Yeah, that's, that's mad. A, and I might might have got this figure mad, wrong, but there, there was if you take every virus, bacterial virus in the world, and put them end to end, okay, so make a chain of them end to end. Do you know how long they would be? <laughs> it's going to be something mad, isn't it? I think it's one hundred and fifty thousand light years. No, it can't be that big. It is. I'll come back. It can't to be that big. Is. I, it is. It is phenomenal. Whoa! 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 We'll, we'll, the, we'll make sure we we'll yeah, check that. Think but of these, that's they're ten. You know, they're they're fifty uh, nanometers. In my head, I was thinking, right, <clears throat> it's not going to go beyond our galaxy. It, it spans. It goes way outside our galaxy. I can't believe that. It's that light is years. So it's cool. Light years. It, it's either fifty thousand light years or it's huge. That's it's just, so cool. And it just tells you how big a it, number they are. Incredible. Incredible. But that what is they so do is cool. <clears throat> they play a real fundamental role so in cool. the dynamics of the gut. Wow. Um, so my cool. mind's, to be honest with you, Julian, you've, you've successfully, <laughs> you've successfully blown my mind. So I there just, are lots I of just, viruses I, in the world. Uh, and, you know, so, and what they're doing is, you know, as an organism grows, <laughs> the chances of a virus meeting it increases. So as the population, say, of one organism grows, suddenly the viruses will attack it 
they'll kill it off, it'll drop down again, and another organism come up. So if you could follow, say, in real time, populations of bacteria in the gut, what you'll see is them going through phases. They'll grow up, drop, grow up. So they'll go up and down, up and down. And that, wow. what that's showing is predation by viruses. Wow. When they drop down to a certain level... Wow. There's not enough viruses, I'm not enough bacteria around, and the viruses wash out, and then slowly they'll grow up again. And oh they'll my get to goodness. It. And so you see this sort of dynamics of populations going up and down, and a lot of times viruses are driving that. They do it in the oceans. Wow. You know, they've been implicated in global warming and climate change, and because those viruses are having impacts on bacteria, which have impacts on oxygen levels, Incredible. carbon dioxide levels. So that they're fundamental. So, so we've got a very... <clears throat> bacteria centric we have view don't yeah. we yeah and what what are the drivers for that then in your opinion um ease of growing them to start off with even you know i said going back i said it was diff- we, we carried this baggage from environmental microbiology into the gut saying oh, we can't grow them so we're going to use dna based tools not that long ago um um Hilary Brown and uh, Trevor Lawley from Sanger yep. published a paper to show that you actually can grow nearly 90, 95% of bacteria in the gut. So they pioneered... They, they, well, they actually just put the effort in. Oh, really? And it was a case... I remember talking to a guy called Steve Giovanoni years ago, and he was a big environmental microbiologist. And he, he identified this group of organisms in the Sargasso Sea called... SAR, I think it's called SAR-11 group. And they were, they were very predominant, um, abundant. But he said, I can't get a PhD student to come to the lab to grow it because it's just not sexy. Nobody oh. wants to do good old-fashioned culture. So you just so got to put the work Tre- in. Yeah, Hillary and Trevor did, and, and his lab put the work in. And they, were, and, and they weren't using any special media. They were using the general media developed by Harry Flint... And it was just, they just put the, the effort in and grew things for months at a time and picked off and um, banked them and, and then analysed them genomically and found, well, actually, we're growing nearly everything in the gut. Oh, wow. And so, but it comes back to that problem there is it's not practical. You know, trying, right. to, trying to culture something for a long yeah. time, it's just not practical. I'm going to try and get Harry on and learn about his oh, you journey. Should. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, he'll be an incredible guest. He's and an elder statesman of the yes. hum, um, yes. gut microbiome. I want to get them all on and just hear their story. <clears throat> and, and I'm sure he'll have so much to say. So um, we're talking about the viral element then. And, yeah. and, and, and so... Uh, where are we going to go, do you think, with the viral piece? Do you think we're going to start seeing more and more studies that say, actually, this is really important? Or do you think, because 50% of the stool that comes out of your body are bacteria or is bacteria, then therefore it's worthy of the most inquiry and resource? I think because they make the metabolites. I mean, what would be interesting with the virus is two, twofold. A, they could be used maybe as biomarkers for the presence of an organism. Yep. Because they are more abundant than the organism. Yep. So if you can... I mean, the problem with viruses is they need a host to grow, and you can't grow them in the lab without a host. You can't do what you can do with bacteria. So you need genetic approaches to look at them. Yep. So that's one way. They could be biomarkers, sentinels for presence of an organism, change of state in the gut. Yep. You know, that's just thinking. Or the other one is they can be used as an alternative to antibiotics. But... Not every organism, it's easy to find a virus that will kill it. You know, for example, C. difficile, a lot of the viruses there are what's called um, lysogenic. So the virus doesn't lyse the organism. It doesn't pop it up. It doesn't get in, reproduce, and then burst out like alien from, you know, the, the alien film. It get, goes in and it integrates into its genome of the host and just sits and does nothing. Oh, right. And then maybe later on some environmental trigger it, it, yeah. could be starvation, it could be that it suddenly triggers it and then yeah. it starts reproducing and pops out. Yeah, got so, it. So you can throw it in and nothing happens. The, the organism just absorbs the viral right. population and nothing happens. So, so the, that it, it will come to the fore. You know, some diseases, bacterial diseases, there, there may be a role further down the line for, for phage therapy as it's called. Yeah. And can phages be harmful to human health? or I don't think there's any they predate, evidence. Because they, they, they predate that's on the a, bugs, yeah? Yeah, that's a great thing about viruses. They're very, very specific for their host. Yeah. And when I say, okay, we get a bit of transmission, we've seen it with COVID, you know, yeah. we think it was an animal-to-human jump. Um, <clears throat> but but we, I don't think we'd ever see a plant-to-human jump, right. you know, of a virus. And a bacteria, it's just the jump is too big. Right. You don't think it came from a lab in Wuhan? No. No? I think the okay. recent um, WHO report that came yeah. out that I was reading. No, I mean, n- you'll, you'd never say never because mm-hmm. you can't, you know, without having samples and looking at it and having all the data, but all the evidence points to the okay. market. Okay, okay. So going back a step then, on the phage side of things, probably not harmful to humans, 
very specific for bacteria, big potential in treating antibiotic resistant bacteria yeah. infections. What about in the context of IMT, FMT? So you've done a lot of work with yeah. Imperial on FMT, IMT. And I mean, I probably shouldn't try and summarise your work for you because you're right here, but but you've done a lot of super cool stuff, including, I think, producing the most elegant elucidation of the mechanism of action for FMT in a disease, C. difficile infection, yep. right? So tell me about your work on FMT, IMT, and we should definitely talk about the C. diff thing because I yep. want to press you a little bit on can you apply the same tools, techniques, principles to try and unravel the mechanism of action in other diseases because that could yeah. be so impactful. So tell me the, the, the FMT, IMT story. So, so C. difficile is an infection, bacterial infection of the gut, um, driven by antibiotics. And what, what happens is people have an antibiotic, they get into this infection, and what we have realised early on was the reason that they weren't getting an infection was that the bacteria was suppressing the growth of C. diff. And what the antibiotic was doing was re removing those bacteria that were stopping the C. diff from growing and causing a, a, providing an opportunity for C. diff to grow. So it was an ecological problem. What we needed to do was get the bacteria back in to put that suppression on that C. diff. And obviously IMT, intestinal microbiota transplant, or FMT, would seem to be the best tool to do that. But it's not without its risks. As you mentioned before, there's the whole donor screening, there's a the whole donor retention. Just getting donors is not trivial. It's hard, right? It's hard. Yeah, and then we do it by a nasogastric tube, so tube down into the duodenum. Um, <clears throat> you have risks there where um, you can go in the wrong hole, and you can like, put it into the lung if you're bad gastroenterologist and you happen to do it badly um, that would be very bad please very please bad. don't do that yeah don't do that <laughs> um, but but the whole you know it, and it takes you know you need a gastroenterologist you need all the different things to go with it so we decided to follow a group of individuals who are having this and then try to model it in the laboratory um, in, in glass jars we model the colon and when we say we model the colon, we model the colonic bacteria. We didn't have cells from the host. We just had the bacteria from a stool sample grown in a jar. And we, we mimicked what would happen if you did a C. difficile FMT. So we put the organism in. We gave one vessel saline, salt, salty water. We gave one vessel an FMT. And then metabolically, we followed over time what happened. And we also looked at enzyme activity and a whole range of metabolites, bile, et cetera, et cetera. So using the metabolomic toolkit that you're talking exactly, about. Exactly, because yep. that's what Imperial are very good at. They've got this National Phenome Center with all these fancy machines that can look at the, the metabolites. Yep. And what we found is in the vessel that consistently got saline, okay, one compound never changed. It just flatlined. Interesting. So, so it was high to start off with. We put the antibiotic in and C. difficile to mimic what happened in the host. It dropped down to zero. Give it saline, nothing happens. Give it an FMD, it recovers. Wow. And so that compound was valerate. Right. And then what we found was valerate, when you incubated with C. difficile, stops C. difficile from growing. But it doesn't stop anything else from growing. Valerate, going back to what we are talking about earlier, it's a short-chain fatty acid. <clears throat> it's a short-chain fatty produced acid. Produced by the bugs. Produced by the bugs. Right. And only produced by the bugs. It's not in your diet. Unless you're taking um, valeric acid from plants for being calm, but uh, very few people who got C. diff are doing that. Right, right. Um, and so we found that that's one aspect of it. But C. difficile has a complex life cycle. It can turn into a spore, and so it can sit around in your gut if it sticks to something, waiting for the right opportunity to germinate and turn into the cell, which then produces a toxin and causes a disease. Mm. So the other part of this is what you might want to ask Ben about, was, well, what is the signal for the spore to know it's in the gut and when it's right to turn into the cell, the vegetative cell, as it's called, the pathogenic cell. That's when produces, it produces the toxins. And that's because in the spore, it's inactive. It does nothing. It just sits there. Yeah. And we know spores are great at sitting and doing Super nothing. good, right? Very good. And so what we found, the other part of the story was that the other feature that the gut does very well is break down bile acids. So the gut bacteria break down your bile acids. You right. produce these complex bile acids. The gut bacteria break them down for whatever reason, because some of them are antimicrobial, so it's a protection mechanism. And in doing so, it breaks down something called TCA, taurocholic acid. And it takes this molecule, snips it in half, and when it does so, it now removes the signal for the spore, because TCA is what the spore senses. 
The spore senses high levels of TCA, taurocholic acid. When it senses that, it knows it's in the gut and it starts germinating. You reduce the taurocholic acid, which what happens in a healthy gut, because the bacteria break taurocholic acid down, removes that signal, spores don't germinate. And so what FMT, IMT was doing was putting the bacteria back in again that could take that TCA signal, degrade it, and remove the signal from the spore. And so the spores weren't germinating. So with Valorate, we could actually kill the pathogenic cell, stop it from growing. With the TCA removal bacteria, we could remove that signal. So now what we had was spores weren't turning into vegetative cells, and any vegetative cells that were there were being affected by the Valorate. Wow, perfect. And so we had this sort of double whammy that's on this it. life cycle. And so that's what we're taking forward now yep. and trying to see if we can turn that into something that's a drug. Absolutely. Because it removes the whole need then for finding donors and yep. C. diff. Yep. And actually, it's but safer. Just to push back a little bit, do you not think you might need the bugs in FMT, IMT to confer more general colonization resistance? Like there might be more to it? Or do you think that a combination of the IMT and the, and the Valerate and, and, and the um, BSH could be the ultimate. You I, know? I think if we can remove the the C diff and the toxin, the gut microbiota will recover. Oh, interesting. I think that's that's a, that's one of our feelings because yeah. after first yeah. um, case of C diff and you give an antibiotic, yeah. the gut microbiota starts coming back until they they relapse again. Yeah. So we think if we think you know ideally what, what it might be, but but you're right, it might be that you need a seeding event, you need a reset, a reset. And you need these other things just to really give it that boost. Fascinating. So are you and your team working on sort of similar workflows and other indications? So, you, yep, you're right. So um, we're also using FMT, IMT to control antibiotic resistant bacteria right. in the guts of patients, renal patients, right. urological patients and hematological patients. Wow. So these are all patients who we know have lots and lots of courses of antibiotics yeah. because either they get urinary tract infections for the you know urological urological and renal patients, they just get persistent, and then after a while, they've had so many antibiotics that they colonise back bacteria, right. usually in their gut, which are resistant to all the antibiotics. So we need to control that. Right. And then in the hematological patients, people with blood cancers, because their blood doesn't work as well, they get lots of bloodstream infections, so they get lots of antibiotics, and they get to stages where they're in a situation where they're full of antibiotic resistance in their gut. And what we found is, an IMT or FNT can modulate the gut bacteria to such an extent that we can really reduce the burden of that and then sometimes just clear it out. Amazing. We and, and so what we're doing there now is actually trying to apply the same sort of process to ask a question, well, what is happening? Why is that? Why is FMT doing that? Is it metabolite driven or is it immunological driven? Right. Or is it gut barrier driven? Because all these different things right. are features that could control movement of a bacteria from the gut into the host. Right. Right. Julian, we are low on time now. Oh. We're we're pretty much yeah, they're pretty much there, right? Yeah. We're, we're 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 done. So we should um <clears throat> wrap it up. We should wrap it up, but we should get you on again to just push more and more on this reverse engineering FMT, yeah, I'd be IMT to do it. and other diseases because yeah. you've been a lot of fun and a wealth of knowledge. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, James. <laughs>